Well, welcome everybody uh, to this edition of Stump the Chump. If you may have forgotten, or if this is your first time attending, I be the chump. So uh, <laughs> feel free to try to stump me as we go along. Uh, and today, I think we're all about uh, tax loss harvesting and what does that look like. And you know, that topic is something that we'll spend a little bit of time on. It's not a, a super deep topic, and so we're hoping to maybe spend a little bit of time on this whole. Uh, debt ceiling and what's going on there too. Uh, but know that as we talk about Stump the Chump, questions don't just have to be about stumping this chump, right, Katie? Yeah, it doesn't have to be about tax loss harvesting. If you have something that you just like really think will stump him, is yeah, that what you're saying? That's you're what you're I'm opening saying. yourself up. I'm opening it up. That's right. <laughs> that's right. Uh, oh, I'll get my list ready, actually. <laughs> and so, uh, so as we start today, uh, so I guess I should probably maybe go through a little bit of a tutorial here. So uh, with webinars, uh, it's not possible for us to turn on kind of the verbal or the audio uh, ability to ask questions. But if you move your mouse down in the bottom of the uh, toolbar, the bottom toolbar, you'll notice that there's a little box that says chat. If you click on that chat button, it'll come up just like you would chat with uh, your friends or, or whatever via text. And it'll come across to us and we'll see the uh, uh, the text that you put into that box. So if you uh, if you have questions along the way, feel free to throw them in that chat, chat box. Otherwise, you, if you want to wait till the end, you can do it then too. So, and uh, I know we had a few people um, submit some questions ahead of time, so I have those kind of ready also. For awesome. Us. Uh, if uh, so, we are on a little bit of a new audio setup here. Uh, so if for some reason, as we're going through this, if there's any audio issues or you can't hear us very well, again, use that chat box. We'll be able to see the chats and just say, hey, audio's going in and out or, or what have you. So, uh, so Katie, what about uh, tax loss harvesting, do you think? Okay. Well, this is a new term, I guess, or new uh, new to me. I, I didn't even know what tax loss harvesting was until maybe about six months or so ago when we started talking about tax season and how do we best kind of help our clients through that season um, that came up. And I said, boy, I don't even know what that is. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, we thought maybe some clients don't also don't know what that is. Um, or maybe it's working in the background and they don't realize how much of a benefit that is um, and what, why that that is a good thing that, and what, what the heck that is. Yeah, so. for sure. Uh, and so uh, part of the reason we thought it was appropriate now and, and maybe uh, just coming out of a tax season is when it makes a little more sense to, to have those conversations also, because we have a, uh, let's see here, sorry, uh, I got a notice saying that the chat box was disabled. Uh, so yeah, uh, Ken, if, if, for everybody, if you look down at the Q&A portion uh, of that uh, toolbar, use the Q&A portion to, to ask questions. Uh, sorry about that, I don't know. we'll have to look and see why the chat box isn't working. Uh, and so when we talk about tax loss harvesting, part of the reason that uh, it's important to talk about it now is as people come out of tax season, we found that a lot of times accountants will be saying, holy cow, you lost a lot of money last year. Uh, kind of what's going on with that? And and for maybe some that don't know, that's a very intentional thing for us to do during times of market volatility when, when the, uh, the market corrects. And so let me talk through that a little bit. Uh, it kind of sounds counterintuitive. Why do I want to lose money? Yeah, uh, it sounds like, oh, uh, we meant for that to happen. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it kind of goes, maybe that goes along with our uh, uh, the uh, podcast we did about uh, how to fail or how to uh, guarantee to go broke in retirement. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, no, we're not in that business. Um, so the, um, in essence, what tax loss harvesting is, is it's an opportunity when markets are down to, to, uh, sell things for a loss where you get a tax benefit when you do that. So if you think about investing and you think about you buy something at $10 a share, you sell it for $15 a share, you have to pay tax on that $5. And so everybody knows that is capital gains tax. And you know we all know the pain that comes with that uh, when it comes time for filing your tax return. Many times people don't think about the opposite side of that. So what happens is if you have, uh, if you sell something in the reverse and you bought it for 15, you sold it for 10, you now lost $5 on that transaction. You now get to take a deduction on your tax return. 
and so what we do in times of market volatility, when things are going down, we are proactive in looking for ways to harvest those losses uh, to help offset tax gains uh, both this year and in years in years to come. Uh, and so that's why we call it tax loss harvesting. As you as we think that through a little bit, though, you know, many times clients are concerned about, well, I was always told and I always thought I don't sell things for a loss. Uh, and so what that which is 100% true. But what we do is there are rules around if I sell something for a loss, what can I buy after that? Mm. Uh, they're called wash sale rules. And, and if you don't buy the right things or if you do it wrong, the, the IRS says, no, you just did this for tax benefits. So we're going to wash away those and you don't get those tax losses. Uh, and so the way that we do it and the way that that usually works is uh, th if you think about it, if you owned a stock, you bought it at $15 you sold it for 10, you took that loss, and then you turned around and bought that same stock again at 10, you didn't really get a loss, right? Yeah. Because you just now, you're just you're playing the game. Yeah. That's right. And the IRS says, no, we don't want you to do that. So we're going to put some rules around what, what can you buy and what can't you buy type of thing. And so the way that we actively manage a portfolio is when the markets are going down, we might sell uh, an, an investment that ha that is in let's say the large company growth uh, type of investment, and it's inside of an ETF that is not actively managed. It's a passive type of an investment. Well, if we sell that at at a loss, and then we turn around and we buy a large cap blend portfolio that is actively managed, then the IRS says that's not the same thing. That looks substantially different enough so you can take those losses. However, in doing that. If when large caps return and they kind of rebound, guess what? Both of those are going to rebound. And so it's an opportunity for us to say, we're not really selling completely for a loss because we're not uh, getting out of the market and that stuff. We're reinvesting it. So as the market comes back, so will that investment. But in the meantime, we get the tax benefits of of selling it for So it's kind of like if you're going to, if that investment isn't going to do great anyway, you might as well sell it and get some of that back in a yeah, so tax it, it's not necessarily forward looking it's more retro looking meaning uh we know that it's lost money okay. right so if we know that it's down then we might as well sell it get the tax benefits for it and reinvest it in something so that if the market goes up we will still take advantage of it going up but we we harvested those losses in order to take advantage of that from a from a tax perspective uh most accountants get that most accountants see that but sometimes we'll have clients who will call and say man what happened? My, my accountant said I lost a bunch of money last year. And we're like, yes, you did on purpose. Uh, not, not that we want to lose money, but in times when the market is down, we want to be proactive. And that's one way that, that when you think about how do we earn more on our money, we look at that from a, what do I get to keep? Not necessarily total return. And so if we can be more tax efficient, then I get to keep more because I'm not spending as much in, um, in tax. So, so when you said that, um, that you're, you know, I, I was here for, during this season and I saw those calls come in with, you know, people said like, oh, my accountant said this and they're, you know, kind of panicking. Is that a red flag that you should change accountants yeah. or? I, I would say it's not a green light. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say that it's a, a, a red light, but usually uh, most accountants are going to look and, and recognize what's going on there. Okay. Um, I don't ever like to, you know, make professional judgments based on that little bit of information, but usually a fairly sophisticated tax person would would look and would recognize the benefits of doing tax loss harvesting. And what happens is you see it in particular in times when the market is down, because when the market's up, it's hard to harvest losses because everything's going up. Um, and what happens is, you know, a lot of times we'll have clients that'll say, well, but, but I can't take all of my losses. Uh, and, and which is true. What happens is in any given year, if you have a capital loss, uh, you can only offset your gains for that year and up to $3,000 of ordinary income. So if I had a $10,000 loss, I can only offset $3,000. So people say, well, was it really worth the $10,000 loss that I took? But what happens is you can carry forward anything you didn't use. And so that $7,000 worth of, you know, tax benefit or, you know, the kind of those capital losses, we get to carry forward and use in future years. So, um, so then you're saying like, if that was 2020, that that happened 
you can write off 3,000. 2021, you can write off another 3,000. Yeah, you could go all the all of your gains plus up to $3,000 in, in ordinary income. And so uh, what happens is the many times when people think about when I'm actively managing my portfolio, uh, is it worth it? Is it not worth it? You know, that kind of stuff. Uh, one of the things they don't think about with active management is it's not just how do I make more on the upside and lower my losses on the downside. It's these little nuances around what should I be doing, even in times of market downturn, that might help my uh, my overall net return because my after-tax return is is better. Uh, we've got a couple of questions that came in. Uh, you know, one of them said you need to itemize deductions in order to benefit from that loss. Uh, and no, Carl, uh, what happens is because it is a capital gain and offsetting capital losses, that's not an itemized deduction uh, item on your on your tax return. That question kind of goes into a question we had somebody um, write in ahead of time and said, would my accountant know what to do or what do I give them? Yeah, for sure. So your accountant, yes, your accountant should do. And even if, uh, let's say you're the type that does your own taxes and are uh, filing through like a TurboTax or you know those types of things, uh, those systems also should do it. And so one of the things we would suggest is uh, if for some reason they're acting like they don't know what to do, that definitely is a red light because that's kind of 101. Um, so yeah, they should know what to do with that. And, and really on your 1099, the that's where they're going to get all of that information. Okay. So that the 1099, which you're already providing anyway, would Correct. list all of that. Yep. There's nothing else. Okay. Correct. Uh, and then the next one is, can the carry forward uh, be used in future years against income or, or only against capital gains? And that really is something that gets into, uh, the, the short answer is yes, it should be able to, but there are different, uh, there are times when potentially no. And so I would say for that specific situation, I would uh, I would suggest that you you talk to the accountant or, or look into your the system that you're using. Uh, another question is, was wondering, are we able to claim the $3,000 loss on more than one stock sale loss? Yeah, uh, absolutely. So what happens is uh, the loss, the loss that you get to claim. Uh, so let's say in your overall portfolio, you sold 10 items. Of those 10 items that you sold, five of them made money, five of them lost money. Let's say that the five of them that made money made $5,000. The five of them that lost money lost $10,000. So what'll happen is it doesn't matter. You don't have to like match up this one for that one. We're going to, you're going to be able to say of the 5,000 that law or that gained, I have $10,000 that lost. So I'm going to take 5,000 of the losses and wipe out all the gains. So now I'm left with this $5,000 of capital loss because the 10 minus the five leaves me with five left over of the 5,000 that's left over. I can apply 3,000 of that towards my my income for deduction for uh, for this year. You're stumping this chump. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of numbers. <laughs> so uh, yeah. So because but my my math was 25 minus 10 is 15, and you came up with five. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So so the the bottom line is, if you think about, if I take all of my gains, look at all of my losses, my losses can offset 100% of my gains this year plus up to $3,000 of my ordinary income. And don't call yourself a chump. <laughs> <laughs> I and, know it wasn't like, that's why I'm not the stump that we're chumping. Yeah, or I'm, the, I'm not the chump yeah, that we're stumping. Yeah, you need to, <laughs> to say. Just proved yeah. my point. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, uh, yeah, and so as, we, as you think about that, uh, the biggest thing to think about or keep in mind is, uh, it's these little nuances that really add up to what we like to talk about as your compound rate of return. You know, to have one year where I'm really, really high or one year where I'm really, really low, or did I outperform the market? Or it really comes down to how much of my return do I get to keep? And what are the, the effects of these small decisions compounded over time that are going to give me a much better result than just any one given year? Um, Year's performance, and 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 it's this kind of stuff that most of the time, as people are looking at, you know, hey, I just dumped it into uh, an index fund and I just let it ride. Yeah, but you're missing out on some of these nuances by by not being very proactive in how you're managing that portfolio. 
any other questions on uh, this topic, or should we shift the gears and maybe take two minutes? Uh, you know, right now you you may have heard a lot about uh, debt ceiling and default and you know, all that kind of stuff. And so we thought maybe we just take two minutes on that as well. Uh, you'll be getting a recording from us uh, being emailed out here in the next couple of days. And again, it's just going to be that that'll be a very brief kind of what's our two cents on it. Uh, but we're not tone deaf. And, you know, it's not something we're not aware of. It's something we're actively managing portfolios for uh, and keeping our eye on. And so um, the news can be scary and make yeah. it seem like this is a hundred percent, a bigger, you know, yeah. So, so a couple of things that we like to think about with this. Uh, the first one is let's put it into perspective. So the last time that we were here uh, was in 2011. President Obama was president at the time uh, and it came down to the wire. Uh, if we look at what the effects that the market had, uh, the market got pretty volatile and kind of choppy when this time period was going on when we're like, Hey, we're down to the wire. Uh, but once that was resolved, markets went on right back to business as normal. Uh, I like to think about this almost like any other negotiation. It's It never gets resolved right away. If it got resolved right away, then there wouldn't be a, the right amount of tension uh, that this is designed to, to create. And so maybe if I just take one second and explain what is happening so the federal government is does uh, has deficit spending. You hear that term. Sometimes people understand it. Sometimes people think, yeah, it's a fancy term. What, I don't know what it really means. Basically, what it means is that every year we are spending more money than we are bringing in. If this was a consumer's household, you couldn't last for very long. But because we can print our own money, we get to do that as a, as a country. And so deficit spending means we do not have a balanced budget. We are spending more money than we are bringing in. There's lots of reasons for that. We could probably designate an entire three episodes to just why is that, uh, but just know that that's the case. And because of that, we're borrowing money. If you, this was in your house, you would be borrowing money, let's say using a credit card. Your credit card would come with a limit. And once you hit that limit, you couldn't borrow anymore. That's what's happening right now. Inside of... Uh, our governmental agencies, we have a system where they set, here's how much debt we're going to allow the federal government to have, just like a credit card credit limit. Once we hit that credit ceiling or that limit, there has to be an act that takes place, this kind of back and forth that says, we're going to agree to increase this, uh, this limit so we can continue to borrow. It's used as, a, as an opportunity for both sides to negotiate, to try to figure out how do we do that. Uh, and, and I like to think about it as a healthy tension because it's doing just what it's designed to do. It's causing us to take a pause to say, are we spending money the way that we should be spending money? Uh, and if we are, how are we gonna finance that? And so it, it really is doing the job that it was set out to do. But if you think about any sort of negotiation, uh, you know, our dad had a saying, you know, he who speaks first loses. And so, uh, which is very true uh, when you go into these types of things. And so neither side is going to come in and say, here's all the cards that I have. Let me lay them on the table. Uh, you wish it would be that way. You wish they would just be able to kind of be very collegial and, you know, kind of get to a good place. This is not, unfortunately, it's not, not how negotiation works. And so each side is going to kind of go back and forth, back and forth uh, until they get to a, a, a happy place. And uh, well, or a, at least the the least of all the evils, yeah. maybe, or however you want to phrase that. Um, so that's kind of what's going on with that debt ceiling conversation right now. Um, so would you say that this is common from all countries or where does the U.S. fall? Yeah, so it's funny. If we go back, we round, rewound the clock, uh, say, 10 years ago, we were actually extremely low. And the way they measure how healthy is your borrowing, uh, is it's very similar to a, a household. They look and say, what is your total production? So GDP, you know, how much does your country produce? And then how much debt do you have compared to how much your country is producing? So you think about it from, an, from a family perspective, you know, how much money are you borrowing compared to how much money you're bringing in every year? And can you service that debt? Uh, if we roll, if we turn the clock back, I don't know, a decade or so, the U.S. was extremely healthy in that calculation, one of the best in the world. 
if we fast forward to today, we're on the other, other side of that we're not as healthy as what we were on that calculation alone. Now, there's lots of other ways to look at it, but on that calculation alone, and which is why this tension is really good for us to be having these conversations to make sure that we're being very intentional about what we're, what we're trying to do. Uh, the other way I like to, to kind of think about this whole uh, debt ceiling thing is just like uh, in your house, if you turned around and just started borrowing money, at some point you have to pay that money back. All of a sudden, the money you have to pay back, just those payments becomes burdensome and it makes it almost harder for you to get solvent again because you'd still have only so much money coming in that you now have to share not only with what you were paying for before, but also to service all of your debt going forward. Uh, and I think that's the bigger conversation that we need to be having more so than just this short term. Are we going to be able to increase the debt ceiling and, and avert uh, the issue that, that's going on? So, so overall, it's scary in the news, but it's not, it's nothing for us to take action on. It's nothing. No, the way, the way that we like to think about that really, I'm glad you keep bringing up scary in the news because that's what everybody's hearing. And I, I always like to try to revert back to uh, what's the news there for? It's there to sell newspapers, right? And, and nobody buys a newspaper that says Congress meets with the president again today, right? It has to be something that is probably a little more romanticized or what have you than clickbaity. Um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, so it is a real deal. I mean, it is, but it is nothing. We have been here before. They've had these negotiations before. Uh, if for some reason it didn't get resolved, I'm sure there's going to be some ramifications to that, but it is nothing that in our opinion is like the sky is falling. Oh my Take goodness. action. Yeah. Let's no, not, make some moves or no, do something crazy. All. Okay. Not all. Uh, there was one other question that came in, Katie, uh, uh, regarding back to some of that tax loss harvesting and, and how does that work inside of a Roth IRA? And really inside of a Roth, it's very similar to uh, a traditional IRA where if I uh, if you make money inside of a Roth, you don't pay tax on it. If you lose your gains, you don't get the benefit from that. But what happens with a Roth that's a little bit different from that traditional, let's say you put $2,000 into the Roth. If for some reason that Roth IRA was now only worth $1,000, if you got out of the Roth altogether, closed it, then you could actually take a, ta a tax loss for that, for that uh, loss. However, if the money stays inside of the Roth, uh, you don't get any of those tax benefits because it's still inside of that Roth IRA. So I think we said a lot today. Uh, <laughs> I think we covered a few different topics. Like I said, the uh, look for a, a recording coming out from us via email or that'll just be two minutes on the debt ceiling. Uh, if you heard the last 10 minutes of our conversation, you don't even need to click on it, but, uh, but know that that's coming out too. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, if you are unaware, we also have a bi-monthly podcast, um, or I guess bi-weekly. No, bi-weekly, bi -weekly right. means every other week. It's yep. every other week. Um, <laughs> Way easier. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the Retirement Readiness Podcast. So um, you can find us on YouTube if you're interested in that or Facebook. Um, and what we, about when you say podcast? Like YouTube's video, right? Uh, yes, I but... know we do. It's it's several things. So we make a video so you can watch it. If you, we call it a podcast because it's also on podcast platforms like Apple Podcast or Spotify, where you can just listen to it. Um, but we also record ourselves in case like you just desperately need to see <laughs> mostly yes, <yoke>. talking. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, you can also watch it on YouTube as well. So there's a couple different ways. Yeah, for sure. And as always, if you have questions, shoot us an email or give us a phone call. We'd love to connect personally. So thanks so much for joining us today. We'll hope to see you soon. Be well. Have a good day.